You're watching KLTX, Channel 15, serving the city of Lufkin. Today on City Hall Update, changes are coming from temporary one-way streets to new voting rules and procedures. We'll tell you what that means for motorists and those heading to the polls. Plus, a checkup on area health care. We'll talk with local heart leaders on how more patients are experiencing better outcomes thanks to new technology and health care techniques. And after about a year of construction, DETCOG is now settled in its new home. We'll give you a tour of the new facility and talk with Executive Director Lonnie Hunt about some of the projects the organization is working on this year. All of this and more as we bring you the February edition of City Hall Update next. Hi everyone, I'm Yana Ogletree and welcome to City Hall Update. If you travel South Regay Street by Piney Woods Academy and the Kurth Memorial Library in Lufkin during the week, be prepared for a couple of important traffic changes. In an effort to improve traffic flow, the city is limiting that street to one-way traffic before and after school. The change will affect the portion of the street that begins at Angelina and ends past the library. That means northbound traffic will have to take a detour at Kerr Street. At the same time, the library parking lot will be off limits to parents picking up students. This too will help alleviate daily traffic jams. And as a reminder, remember to play it safe when driving through school zones in general. Put your phone down, lower your speed, and watch out for children. The Deep East Texas Council of Governments has a new home. Recently, the organization cut the ribbon on its new regional office, which is located off Kurth Street in North Lufkin. The impressive building is expansive and is equipped with the latest technology. To tell us more about the new Detcog home is one excited executive director, Mr. Lonnie Hunt. Lonnie, it's a pleasure to have you on City Hall Update, and I know you are excited because you have just moved into a brand new, absolutely beautiful facility right here in Lufkin. These are exciting times for DETCOG, they really are, and we're, we're so happy with our new building and happy with the reception we've had from the Lufkin community. I mean, we just could not ask for a, a warmer reception. So did DETCOG actually start out in Lufkin and then move to Jasper? How, how did that work? Started in Dybal. Oh. For a few years, uh, when it started, there was no money, so Arthur Temple provided some office space in Dyball, and after a few years, they really outgrew that, and that's when they started looking around for uh, larger facilities. And I, I just look back at some of the historical minutes and documents. Uh, basically, they invited every community in the region to make a pitch, and Jasper made a very good pitch. Uh, offered free space uh, upstairs at the old Jasper City Hall and uh, and the board voted to move to Jasper so and that was back in the early 70s so we were in Jasper for a long time and it, it was a great home to DETCOG uh, you know the city and the county and and the people there were it was a great place to be the biggest drawback is it was not centrally located right. within the region. And, and Lufkin is. Yes. And, and for years, DETCOG operated on multiple fronts. We had an office in Lufkin and we had some folks here and most of our folks in Jasper and even a few folks, uh, folks scattered in other places. But it's just really hard in this day and time especially to manage. Uh, you know, we're, we're not a huge organization of about 56 employees uh, plus a few part But it's grown though since the very beginning. True, and, uh, but, but with an organization that size, it's really hard to manage it well and, and deliver services efficiently when you're scattered around in different places. So uh, I tell folks here in Lufkin, we love Lufkin, but the reason we're here is not because we just love Lufkin more than anybody else. The reason we're here is because we need to be centrally located yeah, you're easier to get to. in order to serve everybody. Yeah. Those folks in Cold Spring and Shelbyville and Grapeland and Newton and everyone else around our region. Yeah, and so it's important to mention that DETCOG serves, what, a 12-county area? 12-county area, larger than either five or six states. I know Trent Ashby the other day said we're larger <laughs> than right. six states. I, I've looked at a map and I, I can name about five of them, but there's probably a sixth one out there. and. 
And of course, we're fairly sparsely populated outside of Lufkin and Nacogdoches, uh, which are still by federal standards considered rural communities. Uh, we, you know, we, we don't have any urban areas within our region and uh, that presents special challenges to us. Mm -hmm. But it also means that uh, our region typically has more needs than most of the others, and it just makes our mission that much more important. Absolutely. Okay, so you're, you're in this brand new building, lots of office space, room to grow. You've got lots of projects, though. We do. We have, a, a, it, you know, we have we have our long list of what I call just ongoing programs that we are involved with and administer. Uh, and have most of them for a number of years, and that work continues every day. But they're they're just a, they're new things coming along that are big and important, and taking a lot of time. But they're worth the effort. And one of those would be the census, and that's coming up pretty quick. How Absolutely. how is DeckHog involved in? The well, for census? the first time, we have some resources. Uh, you know, now ten years ago when the last census was done, I was a county judge in one of these rural counties. And everybody promoted the census. You know, we, we cheerleaded for the census. We encouraged people to participate. We didn't really have any resources uh, to, to apply to help get the count out. We just depended on the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, this year, through the generosity of the Hogg Foundation and another group called the Texas Pooled Funds, which is a a, a group of different foundations around the state that have an interest in seeing an accurate true count. We have received grant funds and most of those funds are going to be put into contract workers who will literally be boots on the ground in all 12 of our counties. We're looking to hire someone in each of our counties plus a couple of regional people that would support those county coordinators. The regional folks would probably have six counties each and then six individual county people under them and then one person sort of at the top riding herd over the whole process. And our job is not to go door to door and count people. That's the Census Bureau's job and we're not, we're not taking the census. But our job is just to make sure that everyone in every community knows the importance of being counted and, and knows how to participate in the census. So will you be just hosting like community events to, to get the word out? We'll be hosting events. Probably more than that, we'll be showing up at existing events. You know, it's it's one thing to create an event and try to get people to come, but in every community, There's there are events. school activities, <laughs> community fairs and festivals and uh, chambers, chamber of commerce activities, etc. So we'll be utilizing them. We'll we'll try to work closely with churches, especially churches in the minority communities, because we know statistically, minority communities are typically harder to count. More remote rural areas are typically harder to count. Uh, we have a lot of the hard to count populations here within our region, and uh, we just have to make an all out effort. It, it's really important. Okay, you said it's important. Why is it important to be counted? Well, the census is only done once every 10 years. And and now they do, the Census Bureau provides estimates every year. They estimate how much your population has grown or decreased. But the actual census number is taken every 10 years, and you're stuck with that number. All of the federal funding and much of the state funding for these many programs that people don't even think about because they've been around so long, things like senior citizen centers and programs like law enforcement training programs and uh, homeland security planning to keep our people safe and housing programs and all of these programs uh, are affected by population. And in Texas, for example, we know the population of Texas has boomed over the last few decades. Unfortunately for us, our area, our region, has had just a very slight increase overall, and a lot of our counties have actually had a slight decrease in population. We have programs like law enforcement training programs and criminal justice programs where the state of Texas has not been able to put any additional money into the program but because other areas have grown so much in population, we're getting a smaller share of those dollars than we used to. Mm -hmm. 
And I believe that we have traditionally been undercounted. And so uh, yeah. it's just so important that we get everyone counted. The other thing is we have redistricting coming up next right. year. And, you know, that's getting into politics. But that's mm -hmm. uh, that's just yeah. a necessary thing that we go through every 10 years. And these census counts will determine uh, how they draw lines for state representative seats and state senate seats and federal congressional seats. So that's important and i also just like to point out that you know we this day and time we have a lot of people with a distrust of the government uh that's just a fact of life uh but census is one of the original constitutional responsibilities of the federal government this is not just some program that someone in washington cooked up it's been around since the united states of america has been around that every 10 years according to the constitution people need to be counted we need to have an accurate count so i think all of us have a duty as americans to step up and participate and make sure we are counted okay so we can be looking for some information in our community about you know how to participate in the census and make sure that you are counted another thing that you guys are talking about and you're pretty passionate about is broadband and i understand why because we do have some real issues in our 12 county area. We do. Um, and we're committed to doing something about it. It is, it's a huge problem. The solution will be a huge solution. I mean, it, it's, it's not a simple thing right. that we can wave a wand and fix, but we are getting started. We've already done a lot of planning. We've had a major broadband study that we've talked about before here, I believe. We are now, we've just issued, DETCOG has just issued a request for qualifications. We need to create the entity. It's most likely going to be a nonprofit entity, maybe a cooperative type of entity, but some sort of a special purpose entity that will literally take the broadband project and move it forward and bring all the parties together and make it a reality. And we need some specialized help to do that. So we are we've just issued a request for qualifications to select a law firm and it will probably be a law firm in washington dc that will guide us through this process of what we need to do and what this entity should look like and and help us do all the necessary filings that are required and then uh, we'll go a step beyond that and help us access funding from agencies like the federal communications commission usda has a lot of broadband funding uh, there are various other uh, state and federal, mostly federal sources, where we can access public funds to support our broadband project, which we need to do in order to leverage the private investments that we hope to uh, bring in so that it becomes feasible in a rural area like ours. So what is the goal what, what, uh, uh, as far as when you hope to... I hate to say a Update. win. I really hate I mean, to say a win. Any idea? I mean, uh, because you, what our our ultimate goal is for every home and every business in deep East Texas, and that's the ten thousand square mile large rural area with lots of pine forest and lots of lakes and and things like a na you know four national forest. Uh, but our ultimate goal is for everyone to have not only reliable broadband but affordable broadband mm -hmm. yeah that's um, to get there we can't get there in one leap it yeah. is it's it's, it's like, a process it, it, we and we but we need some expert help mm -hmm. to help us develop the plan and then develop a logical progression of steps where we can get started and of course the first step is getting the plan because you can apply for all the federal money you want to. If you don't have a, a plan, you're just wasting that money. And so we feel like once we make those applications, we're going to be well positioned and we're going to have a well thought out, organized plan to make the maximum efficient use of those dollars to help get it done. Well, and I know you heard the communities loud and clear during your fact finding. Absolutely. Um, uh, meetings that you held last year, right? Absolutely. Um, lots of people coming out to those to talk about the importance and, you know, it's, it's, you know, we are behind in that respect and that is something that's critical to so many things. Uh, 
this broad-based support. In fact, one thing that's really encouraging to me, in, in addition to creating this special purpose entity, another next step that we're about to embark on, we have received funding from the U.S. Economic Development Administration to do the network design of our project in seven of our 12 counties. The reason just those seven, this particular pot of money was tied to Hurricane Harvey recovery. And so it can only be used in counties that were a disaster under Hurricane Harvey, and that's seven of our 12 counties. Oh. But this is the engineering study that will be stamped and certified by a professional recognized engineer uh, that will verify that this is a valid plan, this is a feasible plan, and, and it will lay plan. out, yes. Yeah. We are at this moment looking for a source of funding to do the same thing in the other five counties because we've, you know, we've got 12 counties to cover. We picked up the money to do seven. We're about to get started with that. We need to get a funding source for the other five. But the really encouraging thing is that grant we got from EDA is an 80-20 grant. We got $600,000, which means we needed to raise 150000 locally to go with it. Those seven counties, all of which are rural counties in our region, have all stepped up to the plate and said, we will pay our share of the 20% local match. And they did it without hesitation. Wow. Yeah. It's been approved by the commissioner's courts in all seven. So just that fact alone gives me great hope that everyone does see the need yeah, everyone's and the importance on board of and, and you're making yeah. progress moving right along. Well, Lonnie, thank you for joining oh, us. Oh, I'm um, thrilled to be here. Again, congratulations on thank the new, new facility right here in Lufkin. It's on Kurth Avenue. 1405 Kurth Drive. Uh, our, our office hours are Monday through Friday. We close at noon, so we our office is open 8.30 to 12.00 and 1 to 4.30. We're there 8 to 5, but our folks need to kind of come in and get set up for the day. But I would say this, and this is really important because we don't want to waste anyone's time. Our staff works with a huge caseload of clients. And so we ask the public, if you need to come see us, call ahead or go online. Many things can be done on our website now, debtcog.gov. Uh, but call ahead and make an appointment because, for example, we have uh, we have three housing specialists that each have approximately 600 families on their caseload list, and they just can't be stopping yeah. any time of the day so prefer, when someone walks yeah. in. And the only way to really do that efficiently and not to waste the public's time too is to use appointments and schedule those appointments so that we're ready for you when you come in and you don't have to wait. Absolutely. Makes sense. All right, Lonnie, thank you for thank joining you us. Thank you so and much. And congratulations. Thank you. As we get ready to head to the polls to cast ballots for local, state, and national elections, it is important to note new voter regulations. This includes not being able to vote a straight party ticket. To tell us more about this is Connie Brown. She is the elections administrator, and she joins us now with her team. Well, I'm joined uh, here on City Hall Update with Connie Brown, Sonia Fuentes, and Elizabeth Hawkins, and they're all from the elections office here in Angelina County. And uh, this year being a, a big election year, uh, we have the March primaries coming up, and then of course in November we have other elections as uh, yeah, the the general election. Um, big changes are are coming. Yes, this uh, year. new equipment is probably one of the biggest things right now. Uh, we, um, we've used them in the constitutional amendment, the election in 2019, and we got really good response from that. And what is different with the, this newer equipment as opposed to what we had in the past? Uh, the main thing is it, uh, it has a paper trail. Uh, voters, uh, have requested it for a lot of years. And, uh, so, uh, our new, our old equipment that we retired, um, it, Five, once we were going to do that, we knew then that we should answer the call for the, the, the ballot uh, paper trail, and, um, and we did. So that's the main thing for the, the new equipment. So that's, in, in itself, that's, that's a huge change. But for with any election, there's a lot of work that goes in into putting, uh, hosting an election. Who could talk about that, about the, the time that you spend and just all the, the pre uh, preparation you have to put in? 
how does well we've been sure. working several weeks already and ahead of you know of course it just doesn't appear you know all at once it, it takes weeks and weeks of preparation uh, probably one of the big things is uh, uh, lining up our uh, workers uh, and Elizabeth can kind of chime in on that so it, you know when you go in and you vote and you, and you see people at the table who take your identification and write your name and then here's your ballot go, or go vote um, you just tend to think, okay, that it's not a whole lot to it, but there's really a lot to it. And, and with that said, you need a lot of help to yes. pull it off. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I think the main struggle is finding enough people to be able to help us in the locations that we have. Like um, early voting, we have four locations that were open for two weeks straight, mm -hmm. and we need to find people for that, as well as 30 polling locations election day, and we have to find people for that as well. Okay, and, and you're not just looking, you're not looking for volunteers, you're actually looking for paid employees, correct? Yes, yes, definitely. Any work that they do, we have training that's paid. Anything that we do with them, they would log their information and then we they would get paid for it, yes. And so you are still in need of, of employees to Always. work the election. And so how does someone um, get more information about that? The main thing is just call the office or stop by the office. And um, where is that office? Located? We are located at 606 East Lufkin Avenue at the Angelina County Annex Courthouse. Okay. And just come up there and talk to us and tell us that you're interested in it. And it's that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Okay. So, and when is the the last? When is the deadline when they, that you can take uh, employees? To be honest with you, we take employees all year round. If so oh, yeah. if, if, during the election, if you say, "Hey, I think I want to volunteer," let us know, and then that way we can prep them for the next Do election. Do you have particular skill sets that you're looking for? You don't know it. No, you right? don't. You, you, you don't know elections, and uh, no one. It's a. It, it's definitely something that people will come in and say, I'm interested, and uh, we'll talk with them and everything and tell them, kind of try to tell them about the hours. The hours are pretty grueling, you know, during Election Day. So we inform them about what it takes to do it, mm -hmm. and then they kind of let us know then if they think that they can do it or want to do it. Okay. All right. I, I didn't realize that. I always thought that uh, the, the people who were assisting you at the polls were actually volunteers, but um, yeah, I guess... You got a lot of polls to cover. Yes. I, I, you know, and I would yeah. say it is kind of a volunteer. It, mm -hmm. They might get paid for it, but they are giving of their time that they generally wouldn't be doing. Yeah. So, but uh, they do get paid for that. I think one benefit of being a, a, a worker who actually you know sees the people coming into the polls would be getting to see the people. You know, yes. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine a lot of people like that. You know, just talking and seeing people maybe you hadn't seen in a while. Exactly. Um, but there are those who don't want to get out and go to the polls or, or can't for some reason. And um, Sonia, you're going to talk to us about the ballot by mail. Ballot by we, mail. You know, a lot of us just tend to forget about, yeah, that, that goes on uh, prior to the, the uh, actual vote in person day. Mm -hmm. um, if they're 65 years or older or um, have a disability or they foresee themselves being out of the county during election time, they can apply for a ballot oh. by mail. And also, the ballot by mail serves another purpose. If they check annual application, that qualifies them for all elections um, countywide for the whole annual year. And it's upon the voter's discretion to apply mm -hmm. or request the application for ballot by mail. So the ballot uh, by mail, do you have a lot of participation in our county? Um, Ballot by mail? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, I don't know the numbers right now, but they're going up quite significantly mm -hmm. daily. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and we encourage that, early voting especially. Um, participation in this, I, I think a lot of our voters like it because they get to research their candidates before going into the poll, especially the ones that are not able to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so then they just fill out their application and drop it back in the mail and mm -hmm. they're they're done. Mm -hmm. How many people on average vote in our county? Uh, over 30,000 the last election. Uh, so we have over 50,000 registered voters. Mm -hmm. So um, our percentage was around 55%, I believe, if I remember right, in the last big election or like election, we call it. Um, so... Uh, a ballot by mail, we had over 2,000 requests for that, you know, or maybe 
quite right at three thousand, mm-hmm. and uh, we received, I would say, back about what eighty-five to ninety percent. Yes. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that, yeah. that's a great return. So it does play a big role, you know, for people that can't get out, you yeah. know, that wouldn't be able to vote maybe in person. Right. So. Yeah, it's a, a nice service. Um, so there are new changes coming um, for the election process this year. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about that. One being you can't vote straight ticket. Straight ticket. In general straight election. party voting. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, that was a huge. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, people say, "Why did? Why are you doing this? Why are you getting rid of it?" And then, of course, it, it falls back on state. You know, for that, we don't implement it, of course, ourselves. But um, so, when you go to the polls in November, uh, there will be no straight party, a uh, straight party voting. You'll be able. You'll have to go through the ballot through each race and uh, vote for the candidate that you want. Uh, be it you know whatever party and of course there are more parties than just the Republican and Democrat you know during that election you have your green your libertarian so there Mm -hmm. and some others so um, uh, so yeah that's a big deal and it's going to take a little longer Mm -hmm. to process you know uh, that the ticket or the ballot now so uh, that's why one thing we encourage uh, is early voting so you don't have the really long lines, uh, hopefully, uh, on election day. And to, not to say that there won't be long lines, uh, because I think, uh, you know, we foresee this is to be one of our bigger right. bigger yeah, elections yeah. again. You know, just like we uh, thought, you know, four years ago, we said, okay, this is going to be a big one, you know. Mm-hmm. So every four years, I think we just do that. Yeah, yeah it's going to be an election. I, I, I think it's going to be a big election. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's already started out that way. And we have over, uh, you and uh, talked about the ballot by mail over set is it 700 requests so far that we've had for the ballot by mail over 700 are we at that yet no we're not not, at not quite mm-hmm. but you probably will be oh, oh yeah oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Be yeah. 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 yeah yeah i don't know why i had that number in my mind so maybe it was the last election that was like that do, do you think or, or do you know how voting straight party ticket versus the new way I mean, how's that going to change as far as, I mean, how many people do you have who cast ballots or do you know straight party in the past? You know, I don't have that number in, uh, uh, in my head or, um, and I, did, I didn't bring it. I wish I would have thought about that. Um, but is it a lot? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Uh, I just cannot tell you. If I've said the percentage right now, I wouldn't I'd be just guessing. But mm-hmm. yes, it is, a, it is a good percentage of uh, the voting, though. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a little different, you know. Yeah, so even, you, know, you always should be educated when you go to the polls, but even more so now uh, for those um, people who normally vote straight ticket. Uh, you know, I think we can all admit that there are some office, uh, uh, um, uh, offices on there that we're not familiar with the candidates. You know, um, some of the, you know, the big ones you are, but, you know, you think, wow, you know, I don't know who this is. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we hear that a lot. Yeah, yeah, but so it's important to be educated before you go to the polls, and like I said, more importantly now that you just can't go and vote straight Republican or straight Democrat or you know one of the other parties. Mm-hmm. Could you vote straight another party? No. Okay, it's just no, always no. Republican or Democrat. Okay, that's what I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we have all these other parties entered in into the well election process. Yes. Well, in in November when there was straight party, of course they were they were all listed. You know, mm-hmm. so. Um, well, that's what I meant. Yeah. So before you could, if you yes. were say independent, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there would be a straight independent. Yes. Okay. Yes. Didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If they're if, if they're on the on the ballot, one important item to mention is early voting, and yes. that will take place when? When does it start? Starting February eighteenth through the twenty eighth. Twenty eighth, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll start on a Tuesday. Normally it's a Monday, but we have a holiday, so it'll start uh, on the eighteenth. Uh, and we encourage early voting. We were talking about long lines earlier mm-hmm. on election day, and uh, we. Uh, pride ourselves in trying to make early voting one of the easiest avenues of voting. Uh, we have four locations, uh, Zavala, Dieball, and Huntington. They'll be voting for the two-week process also. That's new this year also. There was a new law put in place. And where do they go to vote? Here in Lufkin. It'll be at 606 East Lufkin Avenue at the Courthouse Annex. Okay. And uh, Dieball City Hall, the Huntington Center in, Luf- uh, in Huntington. And... Uh, 
the old city, um, the old Zavala City Hall Police Station in Zavala. And everybody in Zavala will know where that is. Oh, oh definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, do they. <laughs> There's some voting people down there. Let me really? tell you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's all over. Enough. Huntington. Yeah, they're big, too. They Dive all. Yeah, they all. That's they're great all to hear. Great. That's great to hear. Okay, so early voting starts February the 18th. That's great. Right. Um, okay, so it's good to know. One thing I would like to mention since you brought it up about being, uh, you know, informed about your candidates, uh, we have um, the ballot itself, the sample ballot, out on angelinacounty.net. Okay. Uh, you, you select the elections tab, and you can go in, and we have all the ballots uh, for the uh, all the voting precincts in the county. We have 42 of them, 42 voting precincts. And um, also, uh, but as far as calling and say, we have people that are calling and say, you know, I don't know anything about these candidates. Could you tell me about so-and-so? And we are not allowed to yeah. do that, of course. And uh, But, you know, we always recommend that they can go out on the Internet and mm -hmm. uh, look yeah. that up. Sure. So, There's um, a lot of places to to find out information and, and the local media does a good job as well as getting information out on at least your local candidates um, and then of course you can turn on any media and you can hear what's going on with the uh, uh, presidential election so correct <laughs> yes. yeah just choose what you want to hear right mm -hmm. um, so election day uh, for the primary is March 3rd, 3rd. Mm -hmm. March 3rd so that's just right around the corner so we encourage you to get out and exercise your right to vote every vote counts and uh, like I always say if you don't go out and vote don't complain about the <laughs> outcome right? right that's right so I wish you ladies the best of luck with this year's election with the changes I know it's a very very difficult job and uh, we appreciate all that you do Thank you. that allow us to, to go out so easily and come in and, and cast our ballots so you guys must do a great job because you make it look easy oh thank you thank, <laughs> thank you, you. Thank, yes. you yes. thank you for being on the show thanks thank you Heart disease is one of the most common and prevalent diseases in East Texas. Poor diets, lack of physical activity, and smoking can lead to heart attacks, congestive heart disease, and other issues related to the heart. However, local cardiologists and the healthcare professionals at CHI St. Luke's Health Memorial in Lufkin are making great strides in healing patients suffering from cardiovascular diseases. Well, February is Heart Month, and no one knows that better than the folks at CHI St. Luke's Health Memorial right here in Lufkin, um, home to uh, one of the largest cardiovascular uh, centers right here in East Texas. It, you know, we all know that East Texas is a healthcare hub, and you you guys have become known as the Heart Hospital, right? We have, we have, yeah, and and not just being known as that you've earned that reputation and and one of that that goes back to just your recent award as well um being named um a center of excellence right correct so the american uh, college of cardiology has given us for two years in a row the heart care center uh, distinction um of excellence in our in our system um, and with that, we actually have had five accreditations this year, including the Heart Care Center of Excellence. So we now have an accredited cath lab. We have an accredited EP or electrophysiology lab. We are a chest pain center and we are a heart failure center. Uh, all of those recognized by the American um, College of Cardiology. So what does that mean to a patient? So that means we are the highest accredited in this area in deep east texas it means that they are assured that we have quality but that we also provide certain services so in order to be ep accredited we have to have certain services in place in order to be a chest pain center it means we have to have primary pci which that's a big term for percutaneous coronary intervention meaning we can intervene and help you in the middle of a heart attack it also means that we have resuscitation it means that a cardiologist will come to the door to see you within 30 minutes in the event of a heart attack. Um, it means that you're going to get into a cath lab and we're going to open that vessel back up and hopefully we'll be able to get you back uh, to your life very quickly. In the bottom line, it means better outcomes, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. So how, how do you get where you are today? How did you, how did you get there? It's a commitment to excellence. It's a commitment to 
um, quality and education of our staff. It's a commitment with leadership and partnering with the cardiologist in this area. Um, the Heart Institute of East Texas, we even have a diagnostic lab there. Um, we are able to partner with them. Um, they lead our team and help in the partnership with managing the cardiovascular services at our hospital. And so if we're all on the same team and we're all working to the same quality goals and the same quality metrics, and we're able to get there. And then we use education and reinforcement with our staff and with the physicians themselves so that we can work in a cohesive team to do things quickly, efficiently, but then the best practice for our patient. In the staff at CHI, along with the cardiologists who practice there, mm -hmm. it's, it's always, a, you're always learning, right? Absolutely. And it's not that you get this and you're done, you check the box. It's it's always a work in progress to continue to improve, right? Yes. So we have yearly education that we do, uh, skills that we always keep up. Um, but then anytime there's a new technology that comes out, so like the Watchman device that we have um, with our AFib patients in the electrophysiology lab, um, we have more education with that. We have vendors that come in and we partner with the vendors who make those devices so that we can get the uh, cutting edge technology into our sites. Um, you don't ever go into to healthcare if you feel like you're not going to go back to class again and you're not going to learn something because it is always something new. Yeah, yeah, it's always evolving. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just get let's just get back to some basics. Mm -hmm. Like I said, this is Heart Month. Um, what are the symptoms of a heart attack? So that's interesting. There are classic symptoms that we associate typically with men. So that's a pain or a pressure in your chest. Um, sometimes shortness of breath. Uh, maybe uh, while you're walking or exerting yourself, it makes it more difficult and the pain gets worse. Those are all classic symptoms. There are non-classic symptoms that you see sometimes in men, but mainly in women. And it's important that women are listening to their bodies. So for women, it's a little different. Nausea, vomiting, what we would call epigastric or pain in the upper stomach that you might say is, oh, I've had heartburn for a couple of days. Mm. Referred pain, like you might have pain in your shoulder or your back. You might have jaw pain. Things that you wouldn't associate with, I'm going to have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, high anxiety in women can be a symptom of a heart attack. So you just need to listen to your body. Yeah, it becomes really tricky with women. It does. Because, it does. you know, I know a woman who presented to the emergency room mm -hmm. who said she had an earache. Mm -hmm. And the doctor did an EKG, mm -hmm. and she was upset at first. And she said, why are you even doing an EKG on me? Mm -hmm. My ear hurts. Mm -hmm. and she was 99% blocked. Right. So that goes into that jaw pain. And it's just, it's an unusual symptom, And but women tend to have those, those non-typical uh, or atypical uh, symptoms. And unfortunately, they get busy in their life with the kids and the husband and putting all of that first, and they're not listening to what's going on inside. And so if, if I had any message for them for women, it's pay attention to those. If you've had back pain that's unresolved and you can't say that that's muscular or I've hurt myself or something like that. If you're having that jaw pain and you don't have a tooth problem mm -hmm. if you're just short of breath and you're like I just can't catch my breath right now I don't know what's going on have it checked out yeah absolutely um, there is a large staff of cardiologist in the Lufkin market mm -hmm. and um, we're, we're so fortunate to have a, a group of fine doctors Dr. Bocciarati actually was the first cardiologist to arrive in Lufkin right? absolutely yes he was the first one uh, to open and Dr. Chandra and Dr. Chandra to do the percutaneous interventions that we're talking about or have a cath lab where we're able to go in and open that vessel up and it be less invasive. And so that you don't necessarily have to have the cabbage, as we call it, or bypass surgery on your heart. If we're able to put a stent in mm -hmm. and then we're able to open that vessel up, we don't have to go in surgically and repair. Yeah. So. If you do, if you if you are experiencing a heart attack, mm -hmm. obviously call nine one one. Absolutely, yes. Um, how does that work um, with the city of Lufkin with the ambulance service? Don't you all have a partnership? We do with. Mm -hmm. So our EMS service is amazing here in Lufkin. We are very fortunate and we do partner. We have uh, monthly lunches with our EMS where we actually go over the cases. Um, we do a 
like a round table feedback. So we had a STEMI come in, which is our medical term of a, a heart attack with an ST elevation. And they've brought this person into us. We then go back and show them this is what we opened and this is how many minutes it took you to get to the hospital. This is how many minutes it took us to get them from the door, from your care to ours. And we talk about that as a group of medical professionals. How can we make this better? How could we have done it either faster, more efficient? What signs did we maybe miss or did we see all the signs? Um, and so we partner together to make sure that that is a working relationship. They can now send us EKGs from the field. The cardiologist can read it before you ever come to the door of the hospital. And we know if it's a ST elevation, which is probably the most dangerous type or that we would say, because if you're, we call it tombstoning and your ST elevation is up, we know for sure there's a blockage in there. We need to get you in there immediately. That cardiologist can now see that before you ever come to the hospital because our Lufkin EMS has the ability to send that EKG to and, and they can be there. Absolutely. Okay. They may be at the door waiting on you mm -hmm. because they now know it's real and they're there. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So to go back to what we first started talking about with the awards mm -hmm. that the hospital and the local cardiologists have um received mm -hmm. it all goes back to all of this preparation this mm -hmm. ongoing learning and everyone working together including the city of Lufkin mm -hmm. you know to help improve those outcomes um, if you do experience a heart attack mm -hmm. um, and you say you have to have a, a calf or even something more Surgery. invasive yeah mm -hmm. you know can people stay here absolutely those procedures absolutely so we can do from the percutaneous, which is the cath, where we go in and look, do you have a blockage? We can open it with a stent. We have roto devices that allow us to get through calcium or hard uh, areas in the vessel. Um, but if it comes to the point where you need a bypass, we have cardiovascular surgery here in Lufkin um, that you are able to stay. You're able to stay near your family. You're able to get that surgery completed. Typically, those people go home in one to two days from... I mean, that's crazy. When you think yes. about that. Where, where you've been, it used where to you be, are now. Like, I know when my grandfather had it years and years ago, he was actually in the in the hospital for four, four weeks, I believe it was. Yeah. Now, um, as an ICU nurse, even, you know, six, eight years ago, we were sending out patients post-op day two, so 48 hours after their surgery. They're up the day after surgery, walking uh, down the halls. We have, that's where education and partnership comes in again, because we have these nurses in our ICU that are able to support these patients and able to take care of patients. You don't have to go down to Houston, or you don't have to go to Tyler. You can have that here, and you can have your family support system. Yeah, and, and that means a lot. A you huge know, to amount. To be able to, to be <laughs> at home, Mm -hmm. um, trying to recover from a procedure like that. Mm -hmm. That's so important. And, and, and then so after the hospital, well. we have the partnership with the cardiac rehab services. So again, we partner with the car with the cardiologists. We have an amazing group of cardiologists and at the Heart Institute, we are able to have these people go to our um, cardiac rehab services there. They're able to um, learn how to do exercises, learn how to change their diet, learn how to uh, mitigate their disease and be able to have a healthier life going forward. Just because you've had to have some kind of intervention, whether it be through catheterization or surgery, it doesn't mean you can't improve your heart health. Mm -hmm. And this, getting these people in there two, three, four days right after they've had this procedure, they're in that mindset, I really need to change something. Yeah. And if we get them in there quickly, they see that they can change. They see that they can get better. They understand that they can do something because really heart health is all about what you do. There are risk factors, but it really is more about lifestyle and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a modifying your Absolutely your the same thing. And so one thing to mention though, you talk about the Heart Institute. Mm -hmm. um, say you have cardiologist who is not with a Heart Institute. More than likely, they have privileges at your. Oh, absolutely. As well. We use um, our cardiologists. Uh, we have Dr. Mangla, Dr. Feld, uh, Dr. Bencada. Um, they all practice within our hospital um, and within our team, and they're a vital part of it. They're also on STEMI call. Um, we partner with them in the same way. Mm -hmm. Did you just welcome a new cardiothoracic surgeon? We did. Dr. Yahagi is with us. Um, and I believe he's... You just said that name like it just rolled right <laughs> off your tongue. I 
I'm impressed. <laughs> well, I, I knew. I, I was. I was hoping you were going to say the name because I was going to really mess that name up. <laughs> Doctor Yahagi, he's amazing guy. Um, very friendly. Um, he. Very skilled surgeon, um, but unusual. He also is a, a musician. Um, he's an interesting character. I well, think he's going to be a good addition to the Lufkin here. Well, yeah. we've had several uh, physicians who have been or are musicians. Uh-huh. Yeah, so wow, well, he can join a band while he's <laughs> Absolutely, here, yeah. absolutely. He's interesting, and he's already starting to get into the education and the partnership. Um, he's hosting a uh, breakfast um, education for some of the staff uh, oh. coming up in a couple of weeks. Well, that sounds great. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we welcome him to the Lufkin we community do. and to our mm-hmm. health care system here. Mm-hmm. Honey, thank you. Thank you. For joining joining us and sharing all this wonderful news. So important um, to take care of yourself. Talking about women, you know, especially during this heart month where it's all in our minds, you know, we're, we're the worst. Like you said, you know, we've got other things going on and you do think, okay, it'll get better. It'll get better. And, you know, you hear those stories time and time again. Mm-hmm. And um, don't be one of those people that just says um, it's going to get better. So get it checked out. Go to your local cardiologist. Um, Rest easy knowing that if there is an issue, um, you're in good hands right here in Lufkin, close to home. Mm -hmm. Honey, thank you again. Thank you. Former Angeline County District Attorney and District Judge, the late Gerald Goodwin, now has a memorial in his honor at the Angelina County Courthouse in downtown Lufkin. First approved in November of 2018 to honor Goodwin's 41 years of public service, the memorial now sits near the entrance of the courthouse. In addition to his official capacities, Goodwin also served as president of the Angelina County Peace Officers Association and on the board of the Texas District Attorneys Association as well as the Angelina County Expo Board. Remembered by those who knew him best as having a heart for the down and out and loving Angelina County, they felt it was fitting for his memorial to be displayed in the lobby of the Angelina County Courthouse, which was Goodwin's home away from home. In other news, local author Karen Norton, who is best known for self-help books on how to deal with grief, has released her fourth book. Karen Norton recently tackled the way children process grief, and that is the theme of her new book entitled Caleb's Kite. The story follows a young boy as he deals with the loss of his mother. Written to bring more smiles than tears to the reader, Caleb's Kite is meant to be a conversation starter so adults have an opportunity to speak with their children about the loss of a loved one. For more information and to check out the new publication, visit KarenNorton.com. Meanwhile, a former Lufkin ISD educator has published a novelization of his autobiography. Legacy is the story of Joe Deason and his time in the military, life as an educator, and the people he met along the way. As much as it is about his journey, Deason also talks about lessons learned as a way to leave something behind for his grandchildren to understand and appreciate once they are older. Among the many themes addressed in the book is the constant companion of change and how it affects our lives. The show Revival is coming to a stage near you. In fact, you can see upcoming performances at the VFW Hall right here in Lufkin. To tell us more about this production is TK Kegler. We're talking about the gospel play uh, Revival, which is playing right here in in Lufkin, right here in Angelina County. And T.K. Kegler, who is a board member and actually one of the stars of the play, is joining us to talk to us. Tell us more about it. And we were talking off camera, and it just sounds like a phenomenal play. And what's interesting about it is... I guess he's the director, Don yes, he uh, wrote Wilson it Glenn, and, he, right. and he's been on our show before. But he actually, like you said, he wrote the play, mm-hmm. and it is a portrayal of Southern gospel life Pretty in much. East Texas. Pretty Tell much. me about it. He actually, um, this is the first play he ever wrote about 35 years ago. Um, he's, I'm aging him, sorry. But he, um, this is the first play he ever wrote, and it's basically a tribute to grandmother's who have taken on the role of mother, father, friend, and caretaker of children. And it's just a tribute to his grandmother and their relationship and how um, she instilled uh, love in him and the love of Christ and how um, it affected his life. And it's really good. So tell me about the play. Is it serious? Is it sad? Is it funny? Or is it all of those things? Well, I think it's... 
it's all of those things. I don't think it's really sad. It um, you can, We'll definitely be able to reminisce um, about your time as a child in church if you, uh, well, being from the South, you know, that's a lot of our experience. And um, it's what I love about it is it's kind of like a memory mm-hmm. in where Charlie, the main character, comes back to his hometown and the church where he grew up is abandoned. And so he's just kind of wandering around and having all these different memories and the play, and that's how the play is portrayed as a memory. And it's uh, just his life as a child with his grandma. And it's just really beautiful. And and there's a lot of music and, and we'll all be singing and there's so many talented people from here in our community that you would never know that how talented they were unless you knew them. But um, I harassed a lot of people. <laughs> God love them. I harassed them and made them practically come and audition. So because I knew they were needed for this to really be bring it home and really be what it's going to be, which is really beautiful play. So you all have been practicing for weeks, going over your lines, uh, going through music. Mm-hmm. Um, when is curtain call? Well, Curtain Call, um, we have a tech week the week before. That means that we'll all have to be at rehearsals for the full week before the play at the VFW, which the play is going to be February the 20th, 21st, and 22nd. There's a special show um, where everybody is going to come in their Sunday's best. And all the, my grandma was a huge hat wearer. She loved hats, so she had all hundreds of church hats and so we're hoping that the community will come out and bring their Sunday's best and the ladies will wear their beautiful hats and we're going to call that a crown day celebration where there's going to be food while they enjoy the play and um, it's just going to be a really awesome event for our community. And so you said this will take place at the VFW Hall? Yes. Mm -hmm. We've partnered with the VFW. It's been a great partnership. Um, We've done the past, we started with the Odd Couple all the way up to now. We, we've done um, every show there. And we've uh, they have been wonderful to invite us in and just welcome us in and let us do whatever we want to do. We have added so much to the venue. Um, they created a stage for us. We've gotten it covered with hardwood floors. We've painted it black. We've uh, added curtains. Uh, we got curtains donated by Teresa Ragland from Houston, Texas, a mar- remarkable uh, drama teacher. Mm-hmm. And she um, she donated curtains to us, and they're actually getting seamed right now to be ready for the show. But it's just it's just become such an even more beautiful venue than it already was, and they have just been wonderful to welcome us. That's great. Because you, you all did start out downtown, didn't you? You right. had a small building downtown. and Years really, ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've just really grown and... Um, you know, hosting so many performances. Yeah, that's just great to be mm-hmm. able to get the, the community involved in that. Because like you said, there are a lot of talented people here. Definitely. And um, so I, I applaud you. I think that's that's great. And when you're living out, you know, something that you love to do, you know, exactly. that you may not have that chance. If exactly. Because I, I never would have even thought about acting if I hadn't met Don in 2017 when we I interviewed with you before. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just been an amazing relationship that's grown. And what ACT, Angelina Community Theater, is about is bringing the community together. Whether you're black, white, red, it doesn't matter what color you are. We want people to come out and enjoy live theater and to get to see something that they don't normally see for uh, for dirt cheap. Because, you know, we're, it's a community thing. And you want to come out and support your family and your friends. Yeah. And um, it, we have an amazing cast. It's going to be a beautiful play. And I'm just very excited about it. And just a little information on, on Don. You, you mentioned he had written this play. Mm-hmm. Um, he's originally from Livingston. Yes. Right mm-hmm. here. and But he spent time, a lot of time in New York, right? Definitely. And, uh, so he has tons of experience and just oh, came yeah. back to the area after he did. a career there in New York. He did. He came back... Um, he went to AC, he went to U of H, all on scholarships for a drama, theater, I mean. And he uh, went off to New York and live his dreams. And it's uh, it's just such a treat and so rare to meet someone that's from your community that has went out and done the things mm-hmm. that you hope to do in your career, which, you know, I, I want to act and I want to sing and on a national stage. And 
Don has done that with his plays and his mm -hmm. screen. Um, actually, one of his plays just got option to be a movie in Hollywood, which wow. he's just really made an amazing career for himself and came back to Livingston and Angelina County to give back. Yeah. And um, when Pat Baldwin and Teresa Ragland created, wanted to create Angelina Community Theater, they immediately thought of Don. And Don was um, more than happy to come back and you know, be here to watch it grow. And it's just amazing how much it's grown, like you said, since being downtown to where we're at the VFW and hopefully who knows where we'll be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just sharing that experience and teaching oh, people yes. here, you know, that's that's phenomenal that, oh, yeah. uh, that he's doing it and that we have someone like that who can come back exactly. and share that. Okay, so the, the play is called Revival. Mm -hmm. It's February 20th, 21st, 22nd at the VFW Hall right here in Lufkin. Um, what does it cost to get in? It's going to be, I think, like eight, seven or eight dollars. But the times and the prices and the tickets and everything are on Angelina Community Theater's Facebook page, and uh, we also have a website, Angelina Community Theater. It's all one word. dot org, because I can't, I don't want to mess up the times. I want you to go and see for yourself and make sure you can come because it's going to be a treat, big time. All right, so don't delay. Get your tickets and come out and support our local cast of Revival. TK, thank you for joining us thank in City you. Hall Update. Thank you, Ms. Yana. Ladies, are you having trouble keeping that New Year's resolution to exercise more? Would you like to make some new friends? Are you looking for an inexpensive hobby? And do you like to roller skate? If you answer yes to these questions, roller derby may be for you. The East Texas Bombers are currently looking for some new recruits to complete their team. Roller derby is a contact sport, and despite it looking like a bit of chaos, it actually does have rules, just like any other athletic event. If you're fast on roller skates and you don't mind the friendly competition of knocking over people who get in your way, give the Bombers a call. For more information, check out East Texas Bombers on Facebook. Well, that's all for this edition of City Hall Update. Thank you for joining us, and I hope we, you will continue to watch for the latest news and information from Lufkin City Hall. I'm Yana Ogletree. Have a great day.